61. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of jo Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from, that, from there? Nathan asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks, Tiger. Well, if you, if you don't have a Bible out, grab a Bible and open up to this passage because we'll be looking back at it um, a little bit as we go through. John chapter 1, uh, we're in the final section of John chapter 1. Next Sunday we'll be in John chapter 2 and we'll just keep going week after week. We began looking in John's Gospel on January 1st, so this is now the third week we've been in John's Gospel and what we're finding is that if we want to truly know God and grow spiritually, we must encounter the real Jesus. That's what we've seen and what we will see in a way every week as we walk through John's gospel. We desire to meet and see and know and experience the real Jesus. Not the one that we've conjured up in our own minds, but the one who's actually there. Now, nearly everyone that Jesus will encounter through John's gospel will have their own agendas of what they would like Jesus to be for them and what they would like Jesus to do for them. And, but what we find is that rather than us all changing Jesus into what we would like him to be and do for us, when we receive him for who he really is, he changes us instead. This Sunday, we see in the text what to expect when following Jesus. At the very beginning of the journey, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What can we expect? I know I've shared this story uh, once before. It's worth sharing again. The first day, the first time I ever had a deep fried Oreo, I was uh, in the military. At the time, my friend and I went to the local fair, and he was trying to convince me to have one of these deep fried Oreos. I was not in the mood, it was packed in this place. It was very expensive to buy one of these things. I didn't really like Oreos anyways. I prefer chocolate chip and I wasn't in the mood for anything deep fried. He implored me, you've just got to try it. He was trying to um, tell me something about it that would convince me, but he kept getting stumped and just saying, you just got to come and see and try it. Just try it and you'll know what I'm talking about. You'll know it'll be worth it all. 
I doubted that I would enjoy it, but I finally gave in. Uh, it, I thought, you know, this is just a thing for him. I'll do it for him. But I soon found and saw for myself the glory of one of these deep fried Oreos. I was changed. Now I know. And I do the very same thing that Josh did to me. I implore people, you just got to come and see. You've got to try it and taste it for yourself. Deep fried Oreos are self-authenticating. They do not need a defense. That's kind of what's going on here in this passage. People who have seen Jesus are compelled to tell other people about him. You've got to come and see this guy. They try to explain, but really their explanations only can go so far. They don't really know him that well either. They just say, you've, you've just got to come and see. See for yourself. Jesus is self-authenticating. Once you taste and see, you will know what we've been trying to explain, but we couldn't have the words to describe. Now, some of you here may have your doubts when it comes to Jesus, but come and see. And if you're following Jesus, doubts might come up along the way in your journey of faith. But don't go. Because here's what we can expect when we follow Jesus is that we can follow Jesus with others despite our doubts because he helps us believe along the way. It's the main idea. We can follow Jesus with others despite our doubts because he helps us believe along the way. This, shows, this passage shows us three things you may not have expected when following Jesus. They all add up to this main idea. Three things you may not have expected when following Jesus. First, Following Jesus is a community affair. Following Jesus is a community affair. Now, this was woven into the cultural fabric of Jewish rabbis. They were teachers of the Old Testament. They would accumulate disciples who would follow them around, literally like, like ducklings in a row, walking behind their rabbi wherever he went, sometimes staying with him in his own home, discussing the law and the prophets of the Old Testament, considering what that might mean for their life, what they might expect of God in the future. Well, it's noteworthy that those who had been following John the Baptist leave John the Baptist in order to follow Jesus. But if anything, this is exactly what John the Baptist wanted to happen. As he accumulated more and more disciples, he was really this whole time preparing them so that they would leave and follow Jesus. Now, eventually, Jesus' disciples become so many that the gospel writer stops calling them disciples and just starts calling it the crowds. The crowds. And then the word disciple will be used specifically to start referring to the 12, his 12 uh, disciples who will be apostles. Following Jesus is a community affair. But it was not a cultural phenomenon of the first century alone. This is actually Jesus' own idea for how he is bringing disciples to himself even to this day. He said to his disciples before ascending into heaven, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Perhaps the clearest observation from this narrative we've read is that following Jesus is often sparked by personal testimony and based on personal testimony. Look again at verse 36. When John the Baptist saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Then verse 41 The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. Now the exception is verse 43. Jesus himself told Philip to follow me, but still, is this still not based on personal invitation? Verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and told him, 
we have found the one Moses wrote about. Come and see. Now, how many of you came to faith in Christ because someone invited you like Philip invited Nathaniel? Come and see. Who was told this kind of come and see language? Now, for me, I can say, well, this doesn't really apply to me. You know, I grew up in a church because my mother brought me to church. That's how I came to faith. But why was my mother bringing me to church? Well, because she grew up in a church, and that's where she came to faith in Jesus. But why did she grow up in church? Well, it's because my grandparents made them go to church. Why did my grandparents make them go to church? Because one day, maybe in the 40s or 50s, in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, a boy was so excited about what was happening at his church, he went to his neighbor, Richard, and said, Richard, you've got to come and see. That was my grandfather who came to faith because someone told him, you've got to come and see this. And in a way, generationally now, we are continuing to say that family through family through family. Come and see this Jesus. New Testament scholar Don Carson writes that this personal invitation personal testimony, has been the foundational principle of truly Christian expansion ever since. New followers of Jesus bear witness of him to others who in turn become disciples and repeat the process. Following Jesus is a community affair, and this should be expected because how almost everyone comes to faith in the first place is through the invitation of someone else who is already following him. And this is why we as a church emphasize community groups, but also all sorts of fellowship uh, opportunities throughout the year. Following Jesus is a community affair. And if you remember back to last Sunday, and the, the call of the text was to point people to Jesus. Point to Jesus. Point ourselves to Jesus. Point others to Jesus. Do you see now how truly significant that call is? Pointing people to Jesus is right in line with how people have always come to faith in Jesus and right in line with Jesus' own plan of bringing people to himself. To follow Jesus is inherently tied to helping other people follow Jesus. One pastor I listen to says, if you say you're a follower of Jesus, but you're not helping other people follow Jesus in any way, then I just don't know what you mean when you say you're a follower of Jesus. It's a community affair. Now, what's one of the most common objections that people have in following Jesus? Simply the objection of doubt. We think, well, I don't really know what I think about Jesus, and I'm not sure I'll, I could believe everything that the Christians are supposed to believe about Jesus. Now, what if we're the one that's wanting to invite someone else to follow Jesus? We hesitate for the same reasons. We're thinking, I don't really know what they think about Jesus. And I'm not sure they're ready to believe everything that Christians believe about Jesus. How should we respond to this objection of doubt? Whether we're the one being invited or we're the one trying to invite someone else. Answer, the way Philip responds to it when inviting a skeptical Nathaniel to follow Jesus. Just come and see. In other words, just just come and see for yourself. To follow Jesus is inherently tied to helping other people follow Jesus, yet that does not mean we have to have the answers for every question that this person might have. It simply means, at least, at minimum, you point them to Jesus knowing Jesus can speak for himself. Jesus is self-authenticating. And right here is where we come to the second thing you may not have expected when it comes to following Jesus. It's that when you follow Jesus, you can bring your doubts with you. When you follow Jesus, you can bring your doubts with you. Now, Everyone in this room will all have our different levels of certainty when it comes to our faith. 
That's okay. Following Jesus with a community only works because of the second point, that we can bring our doubts when following Jesus. You don't need to have everything worked out before you follow Jesus. Bring your doubts with you. Now, who li here lives in Forestdale? Forestdale proper. Wow, more than I expected. Forestdale is a village. It's a technical term within the town of Sandwich. Now, Sandwich has just over 20,000 people. The village of Forestdale has just under 4,000 people. It's actually the lowest population we've had in over 10 years. Now, I have only lived here for about 10 months, and yet I'm already done telling people that I live in Forestdale. Because unless you've lived on Cape Cod for a long time, you don't know Forestdale. You don't know uh, what this place is. For most people, all Forestdale is, and I hope this doesn't offend you, for most people, all Forestdale is, is a place you have to drive through to get to Mashpee. Now imagine, one guy in Falmouth telling another guy from Hyannis, you know, the next big thing is coming out of Forestdale. They say, really? What does Forestdale have to offer the Cape? That's the sentiment here. Nathaniel's response when Philip invites him to follow Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> verse 46. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Here's the key. Look again to how Jesus responds to this doubt. Verse 47. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. What Jesus is saying here is actually quite astounding. The nation of Israel was named after one of her patriarchs. Do you know who? Jacob. It was named after Jacob, who God renames uh, Israel. Now the word Jacob, the name Jacob, means deceiver. And Jacob will truly live up to that name as he deceives his elder brother Esau in order to get the birthright inheritance of the firstborn. But though the nation of Israel was founded upon deceit, Jesus pointed to an Israelite who is free of this deceit, Nathaniel. Again, back to Don Carson, he puts it this way. Nathaniel may have been blunt in his criticism of Nazareth, but he was an Israelite without duplicitous motives. Nathaniel was willing to examine for himself the claims being made about Jesus. That's the key here. Now let me clarify what this means and what this does not mean. The fact that we can bring our doubts when following Jesus does not mean that Jesus is okay with us believing whatever we would like to believe about him. What it does mean is simply that we don't need to sort everything out before we can begin following him. We can follow him so long as we are willing to examine him according to what he says about himself. We can say, I don't really know what I make of this Jesus fellow, but I'm willing to give him an honest look and let him speak for himself. There will come a time when every person will give an account about what it is we believe about Jesus. And that account will determine our standing before God, ultimately. So we need to take Jesus seriously, and we need to seriously consider what it is we actually believe about him. Yet despite the seriousness and specificity of staying with Jesus, you don't have to have everything sorted out to begin following him, as we see here. Don't let your doubts hold you back. They're welcome to come to. Doubt is welcomed. Curiosity is commended, as Jesus commends Nathaniel. And isn't this good news? Let's be real. Let's stop acting like we don't have our doubts. This is such good news. That means if you're not following Jesus, you can start following Jesus right now, today. If there's some things you aren't sure about or you wanted to get sorted out first, now you know you're already qualified. You're ready to start. Jesus won't put you out, and neither will we. 
Anyone who is willing to hear what Jesus says for himself is qualified to follow him despite what questions or doubts they may be bringing with them. Following Jesus is not about getting everything sorted out before you start, but starting and letting Jesus sort it out along the way. This is good news for us too, us who are followers of Jesus. This means that we don't need to stop or slow down if doubts bubble up. If you're a Christian, have you ever struggled following Jesus because you're around other people who just seem to be following Jesus so much better than you? It's not that it was ever a competition. You were just discouraged seeing how much you struggled at times to believe when it seemed that everyone else around you believed all this stuff without a shadow of a doubt. I don't have the kind of faith these people have. Do I really belong here after all? Well, forget about what anyone else will say. Jesus says, yes, you belong here. It's not about where on the spectrum of doubt or certainty you lie. Don't be afraid. Just say what that one man said in Mark 9. I believe, help my unbelief. The 12 will all have their doubts too, and even one will betray Jesus. But for the, for the followers who remain with Jesus to the end, what makes the difference? What's the formula here for those who remain with Jesus to the end? Ultimately, it's that our faith in Jesus is just that. Faith in Jesus, the person. In other words, our faith is not in our ability to comprehend all that he says or all that he does. I don't have you figured out, Jesus, but I do trust you. Whatever you do, don't place your faith in your faith. Do not place the confidence of your faith in your commitment to believe. Because all that means in the end is that your faith in Jesus is ultimately faith in yourself. Don't put your faith in your faith. You'll be kidding yourself how fickle we human beings really are. If you don't believe me, continue reading through John's gospel. Instead of putting your faith in your faith, put your faith in Jesus, the man, the person, and bring your doubts with you. Either way, there's no sense in hiding your questions and acting as if they're not there. The fact is, Jesus knows all about your doubts. Nathaniel realized this. And so he asked Jesus, how do you know me? Verse 48, Jesus says, I saw you while you were there still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Jesus may be from Nazareth, but there's more to him than meets the eye. The woman at the well in John 4, we'll get that, to that in a couple weeks, she has the same experience. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. She says, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. She says, I perceive that you're a prophet. Oh, really? You perceive I'm a prophet? Yeah. At the end of John 2, John writes this. Jesus would not entrust himself to these people, for he knows all people. He did not need anyone to tell him about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. And that introduces us to Nicodemus in John 3. Now, of course, Jesus saw Nathaniel before Philip called him. The apostle John already told us about this in the opening of his gospel. Jesus is the word of God who was with God in the beginning. And he is God in the flesh. And all things, including you and me, were created by him. You think you can subtly walk into church, maybe not this church because it's small, sit in the back unnoticed, sneak a peek at Jesus as if he can't see you. You think you can pray to God, presenting yourself with just minor flaws? in hiding what's really going on and how you actually feel about it. You don't know who you're dealing with. 
You don't know who you're talking to. There's no sense in hiding. God knows who you are, uncertainty and insecurity and all. He created you in your mother's womb. He was there as you were learning about life. He saw you as you contemplated your purpose. He oversaw your struggles and doubts. He was already with you the very first time you ever thought about him. You think you're sneaking a peek at Jesus or in prayer, keeping parts of you hidden. God has been watching you this whole time. And he knows you through and through. And yet, none of this has hindered his desire in calling you to follow him. It's called grace. You can follow Jesus despite your doubts. So start following him today. And as you follow him, don't be afraid if doubts come up. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Following Jesus means following him with a community, and this only works because we can bring our doubts with him. And it's okay we bring our doubts because of this third reason. This third thing you may not have expected when following Jesus. That Jesus helps us believe along the way. Jesus helps us believe along the way. He helps us believe in two ways that are alluded to in this passage. First, he collapses our doubt. Second, he expands even the true things that we believe. He collapses our doubt and expands the true things we believe. Look again at verse 50. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You'll see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now one of the most popular ways to divide up John's gospel is dividing in half and looking at the first half as the book of signs, as people call it. It's referring to all the signs that Jesus will show. People use this title because of all that Jesus displays, all the glimpses of his hidden glory that he shows, ultimately the greatest glimpse of his glory, it's revealed in full in his resurrection from the dead. These signs help his disciples along, collapsing their doubt and proving all the more he is the Messiah. This is Nathaniel's experience right here. We're seeing it before our eyes as Jesus shows his divine knowledge of who Nathaniel is. Nathaniel is compelled by the obvious glory that is resounding from Jesus. At one moment, Jesus seemed ordinary, but Nathaniel's eyes are open to realize the significance of the person he is talking to. In the next week, we'll see another sign that Jesus uh, shows in turning ordinary water into the finest of wines. The Apostle John ends that narrative saying this, that what Jesus did there in Cana was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Whether Jesus heals a crippled man, multiplies loaves of bread, or walks on water, all of these signs are meant to collapse our doubts and make it clear who Jesus really is. He tells his new disciples here that there's going to be even greater signs to come, saying, heaven will open. You'll see it. The angels of God will ascend and descend on the Son of Man. The, this imagery here, this picture, <coughs> is an echo of something that we've seen already in Scripture. What happened to Jacob, the patriarch of Israel that I've already mentioned, he had this experience. We read of it in Genesis 28. He saw heavens opened. A staircase of angels appeared, ascending and descending from heaven to earth, going back and forth. And Jacob hears God speak to him. What is being depicted is heavenly blessing and divine proclamation being poured out from heaven to earth through the ministry of angels. But if Jesus' disciples knew the significance of the one speaking to them, they would have realized that everything he spoke was divine and everything he did came by the power of heaven itself. 
The person of Jesus is himself this portal between heaven and earth. He is the medium through which the kingdom of God will be poured out on all creation. The signs that he will show will all vindicate his uh, personhood, who he is, his divinity, showing us glimpses of this coming glory. All of these things are meant to collapse our doubt and make it clear who Jesus really is. This is one way that Jesus helps his disciples believe along the way. He shows them signs. And this is how Jesus helps us believe along the way as we walk with him through his word. He collapses our doubt. Now here's the second way Jesus helps us believe. Jesus expands even the true things that we already believe about him. Now did you notice all the titles of Jesus in this passage? There's at least six of them. Between all the people in the narrative, <clears throat> Jesus is called six different things. Verse 36, John the Baptist told his disciples, look, the Lamb of God. Verse 38, those who left John the Baptist to follow Jesus call him rabbi. Verse 41, Andrew said to his brother, we found the Messiah. Verse 45, Philip told Nathaniel, we have found the one Moses and the prophets wrote about. Verse 49, Nathanael told Jesus, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Pretty impressive, all these confessions, real early. Commentators say that John's gospel was meant to be um, read over and over. And if you've read John's gospel more than once, you really know how, let's say, underdeveloped these confessions are. Immature is another way to put it. Not that there were is there anything wrong about them, but there was a maturity that was going to be filled in on what they were confessing. These disciples will later confess the very same things that they're saying here, only something will be different. And it, it won't be what they say, but what it is they believe about what they say. Here's the issue. Although they believed truly, they did not believe rightly. They believed truly, they did not believe rightly. If Jesus were to con accept the confessions that they made from him as is, he would be accepting what it is they mean about those titles. But what much work needed to be done. Didn't, didn't uh, it? even with the true things that they believed about Jesus. He needed to confront their assumptions and totally reshape their expectations. Now, all of these titles are tied to something this one will do. For example, the king of Israel will reign over his people. The Messiah will deliver his people. And the disciples are right. Jesus is both the king of Israel and the Messiah, they just have the wrong ideas about what that will mean. What does, they, what does it mean exactly? Well, for one, for example, they have yet to learn that the Messiah has not come to liberate them from Roman oppression, but rather from sin and death. Another example. They've yet to learn that the kingdom of this coming king is not of this world. Their belief in Jesus as the Messiah will not change, but their belief in what the Messiah will be will change quite a bit. Everything said about Jesus here is good and true. Well, what does Jesus say about himself? At the very end of this passage, Jesus responds to Nathaniel and those with him. And he, and he gives a new title about himself that no one used he says, you'll all see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus did not receive any one of the true things that was said about him. Instead, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, something that no one had called him. And this shows that his new followers have yet to scratch the surface of their understanding of who he really is and what he will do. Their confessions are genuine, but they're still in process and why is that? Why is that? One New Testament scholar makes a significant observation 
at this point. He writes, here's why, all Jewish understandings of the anointed one are inadequate to describe the incarnate one. They require the depth and height and breadth of the witness of Jesus. In other words, everything that the disciples said about Jesus requires the fullness of what Jesus will say about himself. Jesus' favorite title for himself, Son of Man, comes from Daniel 7 and parts of Isaiah. He will refer to himself as the Son of Man far more often than anything else. Why? Why is this Jesus' favorite title for himself? It's probably because it's so ambiguous and no one knows what it means. No one, no one has a manipulated idea or, or preconceived notions of what the Son of Man will do. So it's a perfect title for Jesus because it hasn't been filled in by all these misguided ideas. It's full of mystery and therefore it's ready for Jesus to fill it in with the significance of who he is. There is a fullness of faith in Jesus the disciples have yet to experience. And I believe this reinforces the idea that we can bring our doubts with us to Jesus. We can come to Jesus with our doubts because guess what? Even the true things you believe about him, he will expand and change. They will grow. They will develop under the fullness of who Jesus really is. So let Jesus speak for himself and listen with curiosity. Watch as he brings us into a far greater understanding of who he is. He brings us into the fullness of faith that we would never have gotten to left to ourselves with our own ideas. That means even the seasoned saint among you will never grow stale so long as they follow Jesus with curiosity and wonder. Oh, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Praise be to God for revealing to us such a glorious Savior. May God grant us the faith that we need to see Jesus for who he really is, knowing that we can follow Jesus with other people despite our doubts because he helps us believe along the way. Let's take a moment now to pray, to consider how God's word has penetrated our hearts this evening. Father, I thank you again for the opportunity to pastor these precious people and to proclaim your wonderful word. I pray that the seed of your word will uh, plant deep root in our hearts so that our lives can grow under the fullness of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we're able to pray for you. We thank you for him. Amen.